I come as the bearer of good news. The good news is simply this. Um, if you believe it already, which I hope is uh, the case, this will merely reaffirm and underscore what you already know. If you don't, uh, embark with me on the journey uh, I'm about to lead you through, so you'll see maybe for the first time some proof, proof of concept. The truth is this. All children can learn. Moreover, all children can succeed. Even more than that, all children are capable of excelling. This is so without regard to whatever you thought might have been or might be limiting factors in a child's life. So nothing in the realm of personal circumstances or personal characteristics, nothing that is uh, linguistic in nature, nothing that owes to poverty, nothing that owes to national heritage or race, nothing need stand in the way. The kids can do it if we adults organize ourselves somewhat better. So I'm first going to create just a little backdrop for you, then I'm going to take you on a mini journey around the world to introduce you to some projects and some sites where this is happening in, uh, in some cases, in the most extreme circumstances. All right, let's get going, shall we? Uh, we've had an ongoing national conversation about educational outcomes for two presidential terms now. Uh, as uh, uh, as should be the case. You may remember the sort of hallmarks of these, be familiar with them, No Child Left Behind, which was introduced under President George W. Bush. What was that about? It was about organizational accountability or institutional schools and school districts. President Obama has um, raised the stakes and introduced race to the top, which is, among other things, about performance management of the individuals who deliver educational services to children, teachers and principals. 42 states, their governors and chief state school officers have formed a compact to develop what are called the Common Core Standards. So for the first time, the first time in our national history, we now have agreement about what children should know and know how to do uh, across all of the grade levels in K-12 education. This begins to put, put in that zone with the other developed countries who are so far ahead of us in terms of educational attainment and educational achievement. This is a very good thing for us as a country. Necessary, but not sufficient. Because amidst all these big policy shifts, an, an even bigger story is actually emerging. You might think of it as a tsunami effect in uh, learning that uh, children are now experiencing. Thanks to what I'm calling for purposes of this talk, disruptive technology, a term I'm going to defi define for you in just a moment. There are, as you will see, new levels of student involvement in this work. And uh, uh, it draws on uh, tools that have been proven from outside education. It's drawing on what we've known best about educational outcomes and for a very long time but have yet to take to scale. All right, so here's the, um, here's the definition. Disruptive technology, get out your red pen. I want you to add one term that I left out. Accessible, let's add proven, familiar tools and methodology, refined and put to a new use with transformative effect. So not inventing anything new or incurring any particular risk as to whether something is going to work, but rather take something that, uh, that has proven itself and put it to a new use and take it to scale. Um, technology has two meanings. The classic meaning from the Greek technologia, I suppose it was, a systematic treatment of an art or a craft. And now, of course, the more familiar uh, meaning to us is that which pertains to electronic or digital systems. Now, as we move through this journey, we're going to uh, take examples from both meanings. First, the old meaning. So what's old is made new again. There are a number of schools around the country and virtual school systems that are serving all children manifestly well, or what Dr. Douglas Reeves calls the 90-90-90 schools. So 90% of the kids are um, minorities, 90% are, are poor, and yet 
the kids perform at 90% uh, level of proficiency or mastery on their state examinations. This is one such virtual school system in two states, Connecticut and New York, 20 schools now, 6,200 students. Take a note of the numbers. We're gonna go up the scale and size as we move around these projects. So a decade of success in Connecticut and New York City, 98% uh, African-American and Latino and virtually all poor and widely cited in the literature as a model for closing the achievement gap. So here's the evidence of this 90% theme playing itself out in terms of proficiency at, at uh, different grade levels, in New York State and in Connecticut. Uh, these students, as they graduate, from the newly developed high schools are going on to great success at the tertiary level. Here's what that data looks like. Comparatively speaking, this, these next three slides come from Connecticut, which is a fairly rigorous um, state in terms of state standards. The yellow bar over to the right is what the achievement first schools in uh, the elementary grades are producing, well above the overall statewide average in Connecticut. Uh, in, in this respect, and keep in mind, Connecticut's cities are how should we put it? Islands of poverty in a sea of affluence. So a rigorous state with lots of high income, high social capital kids, the kids in achievement first schools are doing better than their non-poor uh, majority counterparts. That is so again at uh, middle school and even as the new high schools have come on, you will see that the same pattern, we're still middle school here, the clicker didn't take, let me just repeat, Achievement first is the yellow bar, the Connecticut average there. The, um, the middle bars are for the urban school districts that are organized conventionally in which these schools are located. So that's where the real comparison, so same kids, same cities, very different outcome. Pretty dramatic, huh? Uh, here's the high school still, uh, brand new, doing twice as well, right, as their in-district counterparts. Pleased to say, however, that when, tw I predict when 2012 data is, uh, is released, New Haven will be a, the most improved school district in Connecticut because they're beginning to learn from um, the d this disruptive technology that's taking place under their noses. Well, no American school district has yet gotten to that point, conventional school district where it's serving all children well in terms of both achievement and attainment. So, so where are American school districts that aim to move from good to great what are they navigating by, and what are they looking to? One such district is actually in the UK, Islington. What I'm showing you here is a map of the, the uh, London boroughs, uh, London and the surrounding areas, and the arrow points to where Islington is in North London. If you've traveled there and you know where King's Cross Railway Station is, that's sort of the Islington area. It's a perfect achievement gap area in that it's where Tony Blair lives but it's also where the most recently arrived immigrant groups tend to um, settle in London. So the challenges in that district renew themselves every year in the makeup of the schools in, uh, uh, in, in Islington. Roughly 40,000, we've gone from 6,200 to 40,000. More than half are poor, 44 ethnic groups and 120 different languages. In 10 years, this school district has gone from worst to first from the lowest performing district in the UK, a failing district, to being the most improved district in the whole country. Let me show you some of that. The Office of Standards and Education uh, had this reckoning in 2000 that a quarter of the schools in um, Islington local authority were inadequate or failing, and the number of schools that were good or better was well below the national average. Fast forward to the finding just last fall None of the schools were inadequate. One quarter of the schools were outstanding. Forget failing a quarter of them, a quarter of them are now at outstanding. And 80%, 86% were good or better, well above the national average. And that earned the district an excellent rating, the most improved district. In the same kids, same resources, for the most part the same teachers and the same leaders, but who made a commitment to implement proven approaches to improving educational outcomes really well. The kids showed they could do it when the adults got better organized. First Lady of the United States two years ago went to London, visited a school, it was in Islington. Every year since, she's invited 
uh, the girls from Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Academy to visit the White House in the United States. Last week, they were uh, in the White House for their second visit. So from the White House to the state houses uh, in, uh, across our country, there are places now to look to demonstrate proof of concept at scale in what we call public school districts that serve all children well. Now, technology in that more modern sense, remember the two-part definition, now we've gone from the classic definition to the new definition, is having an even broader impact. And you might think, wouldn't you, that this is so, probably is so in the wealthy suburban schools in our country or in the developed uh, countries elsewhere in the world. Let me tell you, as you will soon see, this as, is as prevalent or more in the developing world as it is here. This is so across the entire uh, education spectrum, from preschool to, uh, to college to graduate school and professional school. And again, this is not gee whiz stuff being deployed. It is proven accessible, inexpensive uh, hardware and software put to a new use. What a difference a decade makes. 10 years ago, we were saying technology, and it was the truth 10 years ago, was having little or no effect discernible on educational outcomes. Now the story has changed utterly. So here's some of the data. Um, this is changing daily, literally daily. So a quarter of the college students in the United States now earn uh, some of their, at least some of their credit online. That is, some are estimating a 30 to 40 percent growth rate per year in that. The use of all technology-based learning and teaching tools is growing geometrically faster than can be uh, kept track of. In yesterday's uh, issue of the Chronicle of Hi Higher Education, we see the news that uh, last year, for, uh, between last year and this year, three times as many college students uh, ha are using tablets. One year, 3x change in um, the use of tablet technology in their college studies. Now, what we're about to shift to is an example of one provider uh, giving 400,000 high school students in America virtually all of their STEM education online. STEM, you know, is science, technology, engineering, and math, those subject areas where we uh, perhaps are at greatest risk uh, in terms of national economy. Uh, the bottom here is a graphic that just gives you a visual picture of this growth in the use of uh, online learning. Uh, I want to linger a little bit on this slide. Project Lead the Way. This is that single provider that is offering to high school students across the country from the most rural and remote schools to the most distressed inner city uh, urban environments uh, the whole of their STEM education. Now, if you can read it, look across the bottom and see what this partnership is made up of. University, moving from right to left, universities and colleges, partners and sponsors. So domain experts in industry are working alongside teachers in the classroom and university experts to develop project-based learning for kids in these remote locations. Students and parents, as well as uh, educators and administrators, are very much involved. Look at the images here um, that indicate the, um, uh, the, the platforms on which this content is now moving. Students are critiquing one another's work. They're forming cohorts that are guided by domain experts and by their teachers. And look here. The outcomes are spectacular. So they're finishing high school at a much greater rate than students not enrolled in the program. They're uh, going on to college at much greater rates than students not in the program. They're finishing colleges at uh, a much greater rate. And uh, the interest that's been developed in science, technology, engineering, and math, this project-based uh, learning methodology that they've mustered, means that not only is their interest being sustained in those subject areas, their performance is rising in literacy and numeracy and the other core subjects. This is a very good thing. And this is all um, in a nonprofit environment, largely volunteers, uh, um, some philanthropic funding, some uh, public monies, all put together in an innovative way, state chapters. Each state is a tub on its own bottom. 
just a remarkable um, change in outcomes from the students who've been the beneficiaries of this program. So, um, so we've moved from 400,000, now we're getting up to a bigger number. Remember I said that this is as prevalent, these changes, this tsunami effect is as prevalent in the developing world as it is in rich countries. Here's um, an example of how that is so. Bangladesh. It turns out that the best thing uh, one can do to have a successful career in that country is to learn vocational English. It is lingua franca, even in, in South Asia to this day. One of the lowest literacy rates in South Asia, Bangladesh. We might, might even say that its entire education infrastructure is weak to, in some parts of the country, no doubt, non-existing. Never mind all that. Using simple cell phone and tablet technology, 15 million children, 15 million and 10 million adults, for a total of 25 million people, are learning vocational English through a now quite proven, simple, and cheap technology that can be made available and affordable even in a country with weak infrastructure to achieve transformative effect in the lives of the people there and in the economy of that country. So there, there is uh, an even more interesting story behind the story. I hinted at this at the beginning. So children are not just the consumers and beneficiary of, uh, beneficiaries of this change. They are the co-creators of this change. Project Lead the Way, uh, the students in their projects are, uh, and in other programs like the ACME Network, are actually creating new products and services, uh, new inventions, that are being brought to market in the case of, of the ACME Network and some of the other programs like that. Um, and so are helping create the content, if you will, that their fellow students and their successors will benefit from. Students are also proving to be in a project that the, that the Gates Foundation has funded that's still underway called the Measures of Effective Teaching. Student voice is proving to be the most reliable indicator of uh, what changes, of the changes that are needed in instructional practices that will lead to um, improved student learning. There are now about 400 student, uh, 400,000 students in that database. Uh, you're invited to read more about this in metproject.org if the subject interests you. This, this is the work of Dr. Ron Ferguson at Harvard University under the so-called Tripod Project. Uh, in, a, in a careful method methodology that uh, Ron, an economist, has worked out, the, the questions posed to students and the answers they, uh, they give uh, can be um, causally, are causally related to the kinds of educational outcomes that teachers earnestly want to help their students achieve. So they're co-creators, they're evaluators, uh, they're a part of the living legacy of the dis these disruptive technologies. The kids can do the work. All kids are capable of learning. All are capable of succeeding. All are capable of excelling. If only we as adults are part of the, the national conversation that links our policies to efficacious practice, aligns our resources to maximum benefit, and hold everybody, adults and children, to the highest of expectations. A great world dawns.